Uh, welcome to John Rees, who's the author of The Leveler Revolution, Radical Political Organization in England, 1640 to 1650. Um, we were talking in this whole show about the possibility of getting rid of the monarchy. And in this context, it's really important to remember that it's actually a relatively modern invention and that it's changed quite a lot over the centuries. Uh, specifically with John, now we want to look at the year 1649, when King Charles I was beheaded in Whitehall. Um, John, can you explain to us um, what happened in the period leading up to, to that beheading and what led to that revolution and the role that the levelers played in that? 1649 and the execution of Charles I um, was the culmination of a, a decade of revolutionary upheaval uh, in this country, uh, at least a decade, uh, beginning with the calling of the Long Parliament in uh, 1640. Charles I had been trying to rule uh, without a parliament for 11 years. Um, he'd locked up his um, parliamentary opponents um, from the previous parliament, which has ended in 1629, and he was very reluctant to call um, first the short parliament and then the long parliament because he was trying to uh, fight a war with the Scots to impose his version of uh, the Church of England in Scotland. That blew up the political system. As soon as the Long Parliament met, it started passing a series of um, bills and attacks on the monarchy, which essentially um, transferred power from the monarchy to the House of Commons. Now, nobody at the beginning of the revolution foresaw either uh, the end of the monarchy or the execution of the king. There was one MP in the Long Parliament at its beginning who could be regarded as a Republican. That was the leveller ally, Henry Martin. And when he was walking in Westminster talking to Edward Hyde, uh, another MP who later became the Earl of Clarendon, the key advisor to Charles I, um, Clarendon asked him uh, what he thought of the monarchy. And Martin said, uh, no one man is wise enough to rule us all. And Clarendon was so shocked uh, because he'd never heard that sentiment expressed before. And he said, probably rightly, that if it were expressed in public, it would bring opprobrium on the person who voiced that, such a radical opinion. Even two years later, uh, when the Parliament went to war in the Civil War uh, with uh, the King. The Parliament's banners had on it the legend for King and Parliament. They were still expressing the idea that the old so-called ancient constitution of King, Lords and Commons should be the model uh, that needed certainly substantial reform, but not abolition. So it was only really the experience of war that brought some on the parliamentarian side to the view that the king would have to go. The parliamentarians divided during the war into a peace party that really wanted it over as fast as possible. It was a massive disruption to trade. It was calling into question the whole social structure. It was allowing the lower orders to start having a, a say in politics. And they wanted this finished as fast as possible. And they conducted a series of increasingly desperate peace negotiations with the king uh, to try and do that. Uh, the other part of the parliamentarians were the war party, who thought, can't trust Charles, we'll have to fight this through to the end. And those became represented by Martin, who I've mentioned, but also most famously by Oliver Cromwell. And uh, it was Cromwell who first formed a kind of revolutionary armed body among the parliamentarians. But now Cromwell later on would enter into massive series of negotiations, would praise the monarchy. But during the war, he was definitely part of the war party, the leading and military element in the war party, the fight to the finish um, part of the parliamentarian. War and revolution go together quite a lot in, in our history, that war opens up the desire for more from a lot of people. Yes, I think it's an under uh, an understudied thing. I mean, it happens in the Russian Revolution, it happens in the Paris Commune, and it both radicalizes, but also creates obviously an armed force, which isn't what most revolutionaries would choose to be a, the most democratic element. And certainly in the English Revolution, uh, it's the army which comes to rule. Um, and which is instrumental in crushing the most radical element of the re of the revolution in the levellers. So it's a, it's a kind of Janus-faced 
uh, development. It enables the revolutionaries to carry through the revolution, but at the same time, it raises an armed power uh, which doesn't necessarily represent the most popular or downtrodden sections of the of the, of the movement, certainly in the bourgeois revolutions like the English Revolution. Can you quickly describe then the role of uh, the Levellers and where they got their name from as well? The, the Levellers were grouped around illegal printing to start off with. Before they became known as Levellers, they were co cooperating together in the production of radical religious and political material from underground presses. They were part of the war party, the radical wing of uh, the parliamentary spectrum uh, during the war. John Lilburn, this is the leader of the Levellers, he went and joined Cromwell in the Eastern Association and really worked as a kind of partner or agent of Cromwell's during the war. When the war finished, the parliamentarian bloc began to fragment. Some of those, like the Levellers, wanted a radical and more democratic solution. Some, like Cromwell, wanted uh, to return to a more traditional uh, form of probably what we would call, call now constitutional monarchy. Uh, the friendship of Lilburn and Cromwell broke apart at this point. The whole project was debated at the Putney debates, whether the Levellers brought forward the first ever a democratic constitution, written democratic constitution in this country called the Agreement of the People. Uh, their name came from this moment, came from the, the time of the Putney debates. Uh, some say that it was Charles I that uh, originally called the radicals uh, levellers. Uh, some say it was Cromwell himself who gave them uh, that name. What exactly they were referring to is also obscure, but it's probably to do um, with what had been for decades of a popular movement to level enclosures, to retain common land by tearing down the, the fences um, and hedges that uh, landlords were using to enclose common land. That was called levelling. Mm, well, so an important it, part of uh, establishing capitalism, wasn't it, to do away yes, with the commons? Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. And, and interestingly, uh, in the early 1650s, um, two of the levellers, Lilburn and a man called John Wildman, uh, come to cooperate with um, people who are resisting enclosure in the Fenlands. And Oliver Cromwell, he's got still a quite a positive image, I think, even amongst many lefties. You know, he was the anti-monarchy, etc. But he was not really, at the end, as you describe, on the side of, of those who want democracy and equality. And he became like a semi-king himself. Well, I, I think the Cromwellian legacy is a divided uh, one. Leon Trotsky said... Uh, of Oliver Cromwell, better the dead lion of the 17th century than many living dogs, uh, by which he meant Labour MPs, by the way. Uh, you have to say about Cromwell that he did see the revolution through. It's his name on the death warrant. Uh, it, it was his, in the end, persistence that saw the end of the monarchy, pushed there by the levellers. The, the block between the levellers and Cromwell that existed during the First War falls apart around the time of the Putney debates, and then is recomposed when it seems as if the king is about to return to the throne. So that block reassembles, and it, it's because of the last great push of petitioning and uh, activism by the levellers that pulls uh, Henry Arton first and then Cromwell into the camp of saying, OK, we wanted to do a deal with, with Charles, but it's just impossible. Um, if he gets back on the throne, we'll all be hung, um, uh, and we've got to see through the business of purging the moderates from Parliament. That's what Pride's Purge was about when Colonel Thomas Pride went down to the House of Commons and stopped the moderate MPs entering uh, the House. And then the rump, as it was called, the remaining MPs, the radicals, um, saw through the trial and execution of the king. Once that's happened, Cromwell no longer lead, needs the radical left. Mm -hmm. And Lilburn's pamphlet issued just at this moment, the title of it tells you everything you need to know. It was called England's New Chains Discovered. In other words, um, the new boss is looking very much like the old boss. Um, and he wasn't wrong about that. He and the levellers were put on trial for treason. He narrowly escaped uh, with his life because the jury wouldn't convict him and was exiled after that. So the, the monarchy was still restored a few few decades later, 1689, I think. Um, do you think, though, that this episode killing Charles I, the, this revolutionary mood, ha has that led to restrictions, implications of the monarchy that, that are lasting to today? Yes, I mean, the monarchy that was restored in 1660, Charles II, um, 
wasn't the monarchy of his father. It was, in all senses, a, a limited and controlled monarchy. In the intervening period, the period where uh, this country was a republic, one of the first republics, modern republic, the uh, whole apparatus of a modern capitalist state began to be put in place and remnants of the monarchy and the aristocracy had no interest in dismantling it. From that moment on, the development of a constitutional monarchy takes place. I mean, obviously, it takes some considerable time for it to actually become a constitutional monarchy. But essentially, the, the old attempt to reconstruct the monarchy on absolutist lines, which had been Charles I's project, that project is dead. Mm. And the only project for the monarchy is one which coexists with the new mercantile capitalist, uh, uh, capitalist powers. Now, of course, they've got no reason to want levellers or dissenting religion or dissent at all, in fact. Um, so a new kind of ruling class block is created um, uh, by that. Doesn't mean to say that the radical tradition is dead. The radical tradition survives in some very um, surprising ways. And Thomas Jefferson of the American Revolution was distantly related to Lilburn. And in every generation in the Jefferson family, there was a male child with the middle name Lilburn. And the phrase which um, was first appeared in the Leveller's army paper, the army scout, uh, was spoken again by the Leveller Richard Rumbold, who'd been on the scaffold when Charles I was executed, but was himself executed in the 1660s in Edinburgh. His last words were these, and they're as good a summary of the, the Leveller programme as any. He said, no man comes into the world with a saddle on his back and no man booted and spurred to ride him. Well, that level of sentiment turned up as the last words in Thomas Jefferson's diary. When the fathers of the American Revolution visited Britain, the first place they went was the battlefield of Worcester, the last battlefield of the Civil War. And they couldn't understand why the English didn't make more fuss about it. They said, don't you understand? This is holy ground. So the influence of the English Revolution um, spread far and wide. Uh, Lunacharsky, the Commissar for the Enlightenment in the Russian Revolution, wrote a play about the English Revolution, and the first monument to Gerard Wynne Stanley the Digger was in Moscow. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. I think it's very interesting how the rise of capitalism is very closely linked then to, to the modern monarchy as it exists today, and it's perhaps quite telling that with the crisis of capitalism that we're seeing, uh, the monarchy is also under severe stress at the moment. Yes. Yes, indeed. John, thank you very, very much for your time.